been a pretty day all day today. We're going to talk tonight about God's compassion. Uh, the world doesn't understand. The world thinks of God, of our God, as someone that's off in some distant place. They feel that He is vindictive and easily angered and think of Him as being cruel or threatening because he, His intent, as they understand, is to cast sinners into hell. So they think that means He's cruel and vindictive. But God is far from that. He, that being vindictive and being cruel, it's just not part of His personality. It's not what God is like at all. God is compassionate. God is loving. God is kind. All of the things that God is are totally alien from the, what the world thinks of Him as. Being cruel, for instance. And easily provoked into a vindictive rage. That sort of thing. God is not like that at all. Do we read about God getting angry? Yes. But His anger has always been a controlled anger. And his anger has always occurred after he has been patient and patient and patient all along. When we read about his anger, for instance, dealing with Moses, and we, I've read this to you about before, dealing with Korah. Remember, God told it, Moses, get out of the way, let me take care of this problem right now. Moses fell on his face and prayed and asked God not to do that. And God didn't. See, to be what the world thinks of him as, he wouldn't have listened to Moses at all and he would have shut Moses out of the way and just dealt with him. But because he listens to prayers, he listened to Abraham. He bargained with Abraham for Sodom and Gomorrah. If I find so many lives, then will you let them live? And God was willing. So that, that shows that God is not what the world thinks He's like at all. We read about uh, Greek gods, for instance. I remember reading, learning about Greek mythology in school. I thought it was fascinating and really neat, these characters, these people had created and their imaginations and their temples and lightning bolts and minotaurs and centaurs and all these different wild creations of man's imagination. It was fascinating to read about those. But that's the way people think about gods. And they try to put our God in that same kind of category. That He's really not here. He's off in some palace somewhere, on some planet maybe, somewhere not here. And that's not the God that we worship. God is not like that at all. Look in Isaiah 46 and verse 13. Isaiah 46 in verse 13. Listen to what God is saying. He says, I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off. And my salvation shall not tarry. And I will place salvation in Zion for Israel my glory. He's not very far off. He's not somewhere off. There's a song that came out. The, I, it was a pretty popular song, and I do not remember the one who sang it, but I do remember it was talking about God. It said, God is watching us from a distance. And that's a lie. God is not watching at a distance. He's right here. He's with us. Any two or three are gathered together, I am in their midst. And let alone that, He's around us constantly. It is in Him that we move and breathe and have our very being. We remember reading that this morning, Acts chapter 17. He is not somewhere else watching us, isolating Himself. He is here with us. He admitted, just as He said, I will bring my righteousness near. God is always with us. As a matter of fact, in Matthew we read that he says, Lo, I am with you all. Even how long? Even to the ends of the earth. Even till the end of time. As we know and understand it to exist. God is going to be there. And with those who are righteous, He's going to continue to be there. Because what does Paul say? We shall see Him as He is. For we will be as He is. And we will what? 
Be with him in the air, Thessalonians. So God is always nearby. John 14, verse 18. John 14, verse 18. Begin reading there with me. Go through verse 21. It says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. How much more near do we need to be? I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more, but you see me because I live, you shall also live. At that day you shall know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. How, how wonderful that is. How can we say God somewhere at all? far off in the distance watching us or in some temple somewhere. How can we say He's vindictive and angry and He's mean and He's cruel? But He's right here with us. And He is in us. And us in Him. See, the world doesn't understand the only true and living God. Verse 21, He that hath My commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth Me, and he that loveth Me shall be what? Love of the Father. And I will love him. I will manifest myself to him. Oh, how wonderful that is. That's totally opposite of what the world's thinking. The world does not understand. Isaiah 41, verse 10 it says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Fear not, don't be afraid. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen you. Yea, I will help you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Listen to that. Does that sound mean and cruel? No, that sounds like a God who cares. Don't be afraid. What do we say to the little children? When we're there to comfort them, we're to protect them, we say the same thing. Don't be afraid. I'm here. I'll help you. I'll protect you. What do mamas say? Mama's here. That's all they have to say. They don't have to explain everything. Mama's here. That's enough. Everything's cool. Everything's fine. God's saying the same thing to those that He loves. God is with us because He cares for us. He has compassion on us. In Psalms 86 and verse 15, Psalms 86 and 15, But Thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. Full of compassion. We have to realize, where does this love come from? How has He demonstrated this love? See, the world says, I need to, be, I need to see it. You know, in scientific method, if I can't put my hands on it, and I can't examine it, and take it apart, put it back together, then it's not real. That's not the way it is with God. Romans tells us that the nature around us, all of the world, all the nature says God is real. Evidence is all around us. God has never left mankind without the ability to know He exists. Never has He done that. As a matter of fact, as we read the Scriptures and we study, we find that God's telling us that before He began all of the creation, before He started the process of creating the heavens and the earth and all that we see, He already had planned in His mind exactly how Salvation will work out for us to be with Him forever. He already had that planned out. His love was so great even before He created us that He had made out a way that we could be with Him forever. Now that's, that is love. That is compassion. That cannot be evaluated, estimated, calculated, a worth put on you cannot put a value on that. We can't put a value on our own souls. Because Christ died for us. This is love. This is love. And Christ died for us. How can we compare? And can we be stupid and put a price on it? So yeah, I, I'll, I'll let the devil buy me for whatever. We can just sell our birthright, right? And that's not the value God put on us. We put that on ourselves. Just like Esau. Right? We don't want to do that, do we? No. We want to look at ourselves and we need to learn to look at ourselves and the value of our soul 
the value of our brother's soul, the value of our neighbor's soul, with the same value that God put on them. Priceless. Because God loves us. In verse 16 of the same chapter of Psalms 86, it says, O turn unto me, and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant, and save the son of thy handmaid. God will do that. Sometimes men are afraid of God. That's what it boils down to, really. They are afraid of God. And when a man's afraid of things that he doesn't understand, he tries to quantify that and put it into something he can grasp and understand. And that's part of the reason that the world wants to take and put God in a castle somewhere or in a temple somewhere or on a throne somewhere. He's trying to bring him down to the level he can comprehend. Love we can't comprehend God. We really can't. Our mind cannot understand the infinite mind of God. Our mind is finite. Our reasoning is finite. The only way we can begin to understand God is to do exactly what it says right here. Study His Word. Because He reveals Himself to us in the Word. Learn this. Draw nigh to Him. Learn to love like Him. Think like Him. And, then, and only then will we begin to understand a small part of what God is really like. <clears throat> they don't truly understand who God or is or what He has done for them. They don't grasp that because they don't want to believe. They don't. The world chooses to not believe. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that the wisdom of God is foolishness to them because they choose not to believe. And that's sad. In Psalms chapter 78, starting with verse 38. But He, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned He His anger away and did not stir up all His wrath. For He remembered that they were but flesh. A wind that passeth away and cometh not again. Are you listening to what he's saying? The Bible is telling us that God is full of compassion. And when he could have been angry, he chose not to be angry. When he could have destroyed mankind, he chose not to. Because God realized this is my creation. And my creation is only here for a little while and it goes away. That is reasoning. That is compassion. That is love. And another word we put in there, that is consideration. God considered our faults. He considered our weaknesses. And what did He do before the foundation of the world? He planned on how to help us in our neighborhood. He planned it. He devised it. And He worked it so that His will would come to fruition. Christ would come there would be a way for us to escape our own demise. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 it says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Does that sound like an angry, mean God? No. <clears throat> our God chose to shed His own blood that we through that shedding of blood, would be able to have forgiveness of sins by His own compassion. In Psalms 37, verse 4, it says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Does that sound like an angry God? He says, Delight yourself. Have joy. Have, have peace of mind. Because God loves you. Turn all your burden over to Him. He loves you. He wants to help you. And He will do what? Give you the desires of your heart. Are you listening to what He's saying? That doesn't sound like an angry God, a vindictive God. He's already demonstrated His compassion to us and He showed His love for us. Paul in Romans chapter 5 says, Even while we were yet sinners, Christ commended His love towards us in that He gave what? His Son to die for us. When we were undeserving. And here God is saying, You delight in me. Delight in me. Have joy in me. 
honor me, respect me, and I'm going to do what? I will give you the desires of your heart. What is our, our main desire, what we want the most? To live in eternity. To be with Him. To be with the God who loves us and created us and gave us life. That is our ultimate desire. God will listen. God does listen, and God does answer prayers. In Psalms 145, verse 8, it says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. We are His work. The world is His work. The animals are His work. Are you listening to what he's saying here? The Lord is good to what? all. And His mercies are over all His works. Mercy. The extension of love and compassion to someone undeserving. Mercy. And He's full of mercy. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, it said, in verse 37, it gives us an illustration of Jesus Himself. He says that Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when He saw the multitudes, He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted. They were weak. They were tired. And were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he to his disciples, The harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. The Lord looked upon them with compassion because he loved them. God desires to forgive and show mercy rather than to destroy. He would rather have us be saved. He would rather have us be in Christ and be with him in eternity rather than destroy us. In Micah chapter 7, verse 18 and 19, it says, Who is a God like that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? That would be us. Remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and that Thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. <clears throat> that is a God of compassion. That is a God of mercy and love. And it, God is telling us through His Word here exactly what His wish is. That's what He wants to do. Something we need to remember. God never moves away from us. We leave away from God. We choose to go back into the world. We choose to sin. We choose to walk the path that we want. God sets us on the path and He says, walk the path I prescribe. Don't turn to the left or to the right. We make that choice. We go to the right or we go to the left. We make the choice to move away from God. God never moves away from us. God wants us to be in heaven with Him. God has done everything that He can do because He created us with what we call a free will. He wants us to love Him. He could have created us. He could have even created the angels with a, with the love and compassion for Him, but it would have been one He made, not one that was truly given. So he wants us to love Him because we want to love Him. He wants us to obey Him and worship Him because we want to, not because He made us. <coughs> love that is true is love that is free, not love that is compelled. God freely loves us. He is not compelled to do that. He chose to do that. And He wants that same kind of love to be given back to Him. One that is free. One that is from the heart and the desire to love and care. Not one that is forced or constrained or compelled. 
That's why he created us with a free will. Because the love that is true, the love that is honest, is one that is freely given. And that is what he wants. God wants us to be whole and complete. He does not want us to suffer, but rather to have the hope and salvation that He provides for us. He wants us to have that. In Matt, uh, see Mark chapter 1 and verse 40 and 41. <clears throat> it says, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and said, I will now be clean. A perfect example. If we love Him, what did He say? If you delight in Me, if you love Me, if you follow Me, well, I will give you the, delight, the, the desires of your heart. All we have to do is what? Listen and obey. That's all we have to do. God wills us to be clean. He made it possible by sacrificing His Son in our place. When we grow in Christ and learn to love with the same love that God loves us with, we are to show the same compassion that God shows to us. Think about that. When we learn to love like Him, we will be like Him. When we demonstrate the same compassion that He demonstrates to us. Finally, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Finally, be you all of one mind, having what compassion one for another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil, not railing for railing, but contrariwise, blessing. Knowing that you are thereunto called, that you should what? Inherit the blessing. In other words, you were called to love like me. You were called to act like me. Be like me, because why? You are to inherit a blessing. God's blessed us. And we are to love each other with that same love. Be compassionate one for another, just as He's compassionate with us. God is truly compassionate. Love God, obey His commandments. That's all we have to do. And that love that is already there will be bounding and overflowing, just like it talks about in Peter. There won't be any limit to it. There is never a limit to it. God's love is an eternal love. His compassion is an eternal compassion. What more could we ask? We can't. Can we? If you're here tonight and you are not a child of God, you have an opportunity to put your Lord on in baptism and become a child of God and enjoy that compassion that God has extended to you. If you're here tonight and you are a child of God, but you have stumbled and fallen, you've made a mistake, and you want the Lord's forgiveness, we are here to pray on your behalf. God asks you to come to Him. He says, you have not because you ask not. Or we don't have forgiveness if we don't ask. You need to repent. And we need to ask God to forgive us. And what does John say? He will. Because that sacrifice made on our behalf is an eternal one. And the Lord's blood is always there. Won't you come? Well, together we stand by chainsaw.